good morning, everybody. And um, it's so nice to be with you again. So today in part two, we're going to, and this is gonna be a, a difficult conversation at times, but we're going to be really looking at the ways in which the culture of disinformation <clears throat> and um, the partnerships that have come together to align to expand and increase oppression of uh, gender diverse and trans people over many decades. And um, it may seem like this just exploded in the last couple of years, but the building blocks for it go back a very long time. And there's a lot of direct connection to other forms of intersectional intolerance. So let's start with talking about intersectional intolerance. And even though we could take this back to the 15th century to begin with, which by the way, I do in my transgender in America history, um, we're gonna start in the 1950s and we're gonna start with Brown versus Board of, Board of Education. And I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, but, um, and you may be wondering, what does that have to do with gender diversity and things like that? Well, there are a lot of intersections. And in 1954 in Brown v, um, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation, um, separate but equal, was not anywhere close to equal. Um, and there's a much deeper dive to go into all of the ramifications of Brown v Board of Education, including the negative impact that it had on very successful um, um, black oriented schools. So it wasn't all the positive, right? But there's components of this that triggered some things that we're still dealing with in the United States today. And one of those was that white evangelical communities opened private schools um, in reaction to people's concerns, um, i.e. prejudices and biases about black and white children, black and uh, white and brown children, black and brown children, integrating in the schools, um, evangelical church groups founded their own schools, which the government could not dictate um, that they had to segregate those. Uh, that they, I'm sorry, that they had to integrate those. And they claimed that they were just founding these two uh, on the basis of religious freedom. Among the two really earliest ones that did this was Jerry Falwell's Lynch, Lynchburg Christian Academy and Bob Jones University. And they were pretty blatant in the fact that these were only being attended. They were white students were only welcome in these religious schools. And they came to be known, these and other schools that, that popped up, they came to be known as segregation academies. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act of, of that year um, which was passed by a Democrat majority and signed by Democrat President Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, after that act was passed, the feds threatened to revoke tax exempt status for those segregation academies. And that further pushed um, evangelical, um, particularly in what we now call red states, by the way, they weren't always called red states, they were just called states, but um, further pushed folks away from what they thought were progressive policies or what they thought were actually, um, um, well, integration when they didn't want to integrate and in expanding welfare states and things like that, which they all saw as, as progressive liberal lefty policies. And it pushed them more and more to the right and towards the Republican Party. And the Republican Party was more than happy to accept them and also nurture these feelings that they were having. In 1965, the Voting Rights Act, which was huge, there's one of my heroes, um, John Lewis, um, was passed also by a Democratic majority signed by Lyndon B. Johnson. And suddenly we had in states where, where 
black and brown and, and, and Native American and other minority folks had never been able to really participate in the voting process because of Jim Crow laws began to vote. And they were registering as Democrats because why? The Democrats were the ones that were passing the laws that were getting them power that they should have had uh, centuries ago, um, but certainly decades before that. And this further drove white evangelical voters specifically to register as Republicans. And so there's a pattern developing that, um, that from a political standpoint, um, the Republican Party in particular, but conservative thinkers in general identified that, that they could steal what had been traditional Democrat votes from them by adhering and, and appealing more to um, white flight, white fear, um, opposition to integration, um, women's rights, um, just these conservative things that were classified as conservative thinking. Um, and this began what ultimately results in a significant marriage of politics and religion. Jerry Falwell and another very impactful individual in conservative um, and evangelical politics, Paul Weirich, um, argued that the federal government was violating states' rights by requiring states to integrate. Um, and more that states, that the federal government was turning it back, it's back on white people, um, more in favor of African Americans and Latinos. And that very thought and concept is so problematic that um, I'm just going to leave y'all to come to your own conclusions about that. So now we're going to begin to see more. Um, key clear examples of intersectional intolerance that has been building. Um, it's been building in this country for well since we began being intolerant. But um, in the mid 60s, it became very um, intentional, right? And so between 1966 and 1968, when he was getting ready to run for president, um, Nixon and um, his Republican party advisors um, came up with what they called the Southern strategy. And the Southern strategy was intended to harness um, primarily the opposition of white conservative religious believers, um, in most cases, evangelicals, um, to harness their opposition to integration and to be more on the side of states' rights, saying, well, no, you know, the feds are overstepping. We as, we as Republicans, we as conservatives don't believe the Fed should tell states how to run their schools or how to integrate people. We think that's an overreach. And that message sadly appealed to a lot of people. Um, a Nixon strategist named Kevin Phillips specifically developed and crafted this strategy. And the goal was, as you can see, bring the largest number of white ethnic prejudices into one political party. This was the strategy, is that let's get everybody who's uncomfortable with, all, with, with the things that the, 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 the so-called liberals um, have done with regard to social justice and integration and voting rights and women's rights and things like that. Let's get all those alienated people into one party so that we can leverage them. And in fact, Kevin Phillips, who wrote a book called The Emerging Republican Majority, um, actually said this um, in his book, the more Negroes who register as Democrats in the South, the sooner the Negrophobe whites will quit the Democrats and become Republicans. So that's um, pretty evil. It's certainly cynical um, and it worked. So as we move on now, what we're seeing is that over this course of the 10, 12, 13 years or so, this coalition began forming of people that were concerned about how fast societal change was happening, um, how fast integration and racial equality was entering the conversation. I mean, Lord knows we haven't solved that, right? Um, 
but the conversations were had being had out in public by people in power. And the people that were unnerved by that began moving and coalescing into a particular political party. But as of yet, religious leaders hadn't actually um, inserted their voices specifically in this. The, they were dating, but the marriage hadn't happened quite yet. And then um, in the early 70s, and one of the key things that triggered this meeting of the twain um, was that in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from the Diagnostic and, St and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This was very triggering, and this further pushed um, conservative religious followers, um, again, primarily evangelicals, and, more, and most importantly, their leadership into feeling like what, they were losing their grip on a controllable societal conversation, right? That, that matched their morals or their belief system. In the mid seventies, conservative politicians and Christian evangelicals amplified this growing alliance um, which also amplified the power this alliance would have. Um, and it was around a variety of different things, including atheism, multiculturalism, certainly abortion rights, um, the passage uh, or the um, overruling uh, at the Supreme Court of Roe v. Roe v. Wade um, was a big deal. And in the post Stonewall years here, Stonewall happened in 69, um, folded into all of this was opposition and fear of what was going on with the gay rights movement. In 1977, um, several things happened. Um, and it was really the rise of Jerry Falwell and um, the far right alliance begins to really speak publicly about that LGBTQ people weren't just, um, and by the way, the Q didn't even exist at that point in time. <clears throat> well, it, it did. The Q, queer, existed then, but it was only as a, a pejorative. It was only a, an insult. This is when we began seeing the framing of, the public framing of being gay. And it was primarily focused on sexual orientation at the time. The public framing of being gay as being a moral failing as opposed to a mental illness or mental sickness or, or even perversion right, that it was both a quote unquote perversion and a failure of morals and the embracing of America of gay rights on a slow but steady process, in a slow but steady process, um, was cause for great concern for these folks. And you can see it resulted in a Time Magazine cover for Mr. Falwell. Any questions? I'll say something. Everybody's quiet. Um, so I'm trying to figure out like what I'm going to say. So I'm struggling with this, right? Like this is frustrating me. So I've never seen this, this uh, data before. So this is enlightening. Um, at the same time, um, it's like infuriating to see. So I guess I just want to say it's bullshit and uh, just call it out. Right. And it's frustrating. And so I think I'm just going to leave it as it's bullshit. So if no one's going to say anything, I'm just going to throw that out there. So one of the things, one of the reasons that I'm doing this is I'm so glad you, you commented, Sean, because one of the reasons I'm doing this is that we, one of the, you know, you know the, the, that, that statement, those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. One of the problems that we just have is that we assume that all of the current issues that we're dealing with right now just kind of popped up organically out of nowhere like a month ago or a year ago and um, for, even for people that are um, themselves evangelical or religious um, I think most of them don't understand sort of the cascade of processes that happened here that gradually turned something that was a personal 
relationship with the supreme being or with a messiah or with the savior or whatever the teachings of your religion are to be practiced in the privacy of your own life of your own home and within your within your faith group how it sort of gradually became this juggernaut of deciding who was okay in this country and who wasn't and um we have to understand that this is this is the result of uh, intentional actions across many decades um, that have led us to where we are right now. You begin at 1954, yeah. but there was so much of uh, the role of religion prior to this in terms of creating the, the racial hierarchy and who was less than and who was to obey whom and so forth. So, right. and I, I just love this clean line, the way you've walked through politics, race and religion so cleanly with these precise kind of moments in time and quotes and comments. I, I really appreciate it, Jen. Thank you, Dr. Williams. If you haven't visited and gone to the 1619 Project yet, then uh, I want you to sign off on this training right now <laughs> and go to the 1619 Project, right? Thank you all. So something happened in 1977 that was a spark plug, was a catalyst for much that's happened since then. The only explanation as to why we have gross immorality and such social perversion in the United States today is because Christians have retreated from their God-given responsibility. They have not resisted Satan sufficiently they have not consistently stood for biblical principles. Sorry. Little by little, they have surrendered their responsibilities for social and economic security. They have surrendered self-government for welfare government. You see, government is the flow of power and force. When government is in the hands of godly men, it is good. But in the hands of all others, it is evil. The real challenge to Christians in this country is, do we really want to save America? Do we want to prevent it being taken over by a godless atheist? Now, if that sounds extreme, so be it. But that is the challenge we face because the other side is working. And the question is, are we willing to work too? Nate O'Brien is a former Miss Oklahoma, a pop singer with three gold records to her credit. Until just lately, she's been identified with nothing more controversial than orange juice. Well, today she's at the center of a human rights controversy raging in Dade County, Florida, where earlier this year the county commission made it illegal to discriminate against homosexuals in hiring and in housing. She will use any forum, the church pulpit, a letter writing campaign, or television talk shows. For several years I've been praying for God to revive America. And when word came that, that there was an ordinance in Miami that, that would allow known homosexuals to teach my children, God help us as a nation to stand in these dark days. There are many evil things that would claim under the disguise of discrimination and under civil rights would claim the civil rights of our children. And thank you so much for all the good work you did. From her supporters, Brian has organized a group called Save Our Children. The campaign gathered 60,000 signatures and may force a public vote on the amendment. Their fight has provoked a counter movement that has polarized the public. According to the word of God, it's an abomination. Uh, to practice homosexuality and the same is true for like Archbishop Carroll who took the stand that he would go to jail rather than to uh, hire known homosexuals into their schools and our pastor said that he would do the same and would even burn the school rather than allow them to be taught the homosexuals and uh, we feel as strongly just biologically that God made mothers so that we could reproduce homosexuals cannot reproduce biologically but they have to reproduce by recruiting our children
Supreme Court today ruled that abortion is completely a private matter to be decided by mother and doctor in the first three months of pregnancy. The landmark decision to legalize abortion shook evangelical leaders such as Jerry Falwell. What followed became a movement created by Falwell that would make his name nationally known by fans and critics. As Glenn Utter explains, quote, assisted by such conservative political strategists as Paul Ryrich, Howard Phillips, and Edward E. McAteer, the popular preacher launched Moral Majority Incorporated in 1979, Paul will oppose President Jimmy Carter and his stance on homosexuality and abortion. Falwell saw Carter's initiatives during his term as an agenda to sanction homosexuality, expand daycare, create new government programs to regulate families, and ensure federal funding to abortion. His broad, young, and energetic base propelled the Republican candidate Ronald Reagan to victory in the 1980 presidential election. So there's a lot to unpack um, there. And I just want to, again, open it up for y'all to share anything that you thought of or any comments you have from or anything you learned from seeing that video um and this brings us now up to 1980 right and so with that does anybody have any questions um i see in the chat brian asked it is always interesting who is actually pushing an agenda um brian would you like to um could, could you expand on that a little bit? Sure, yeah, because that's, uh, you know, the, just words, so it can be easily uh, interpreted differently. It, it was just, you know, interesting to me and, and reminding of me that, you know, to hear um, all the individuals in, in that uh, historical piece of, you know, we have to protect America from, you know, these, these others who are pushing their agenda and trying to sway our, our hearts and minds and, um, and, you know, just that reflection of, well, wait, who's actually pushing an agenda right. here, right? Who, who's right. trying to control thought in this? Um, I, think, I think that's a brilliant point. I mean, I suppose you could frame, <clears throat> let's just for a moment go down a dark alley. And you could frame um, Martin Luther King and Brown v. Board of Education as um, they're pushing this agenda of equal rights for all human beings. I mean, that's a pretty radical concept, you know, that all human beings have the right to live and vote and be safe and not murdered for whistling at a white woman, allegedly, um, as a 14-year-old child. And that's a reference to Emmett Till. But yeah, you can reframe anything you want to. If you're the party that's frightened by social change, then, then for you, any, anything that seems to be embracing social change or equity or justice or expanding consciousness, um, that may seem like an agenda to you when it's really just human rights. Yeah. Anybody else? So in 1980, um, at this point in time, primarily because of how effective the moral majority um, was in helping to get Ronald Reagan elected. And what was, what was really a milestone about this was that Jimmy Carter had been the most wear his religion on his sleeve president we'd ever had. Ever. So if, you, if anybody was going to think that there was somebody who was going to push religion into politics from a position of great power, that being president, people would have thought it would have been, well, Jimmy Carter, right? Jimmy Carter understood, this is my personal belief. This is what guides me. It is not the, 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 the federal or moral or religious prescription for everybody. So they used the fact that he was open to social change while at the same time holding individual personal religious beliefs against him, right? And so by 1980, the marriage was, um, it was done. <laughs> and um, from that point forward, there was no separating 
conservative religion, primarily, again, evangelical, from the Republican Party. And at that same year, there was a new edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, version three, that came out. And in that um, manual, they had a, a brand new diagnosis. And that diagnosis was gender identity disorder. And it was meant to pathologize people whose gender identities were diverse from what they were assigned at birth um, or that didn't correspond with their biological sex. There are many people that think that this was a conservative um, mental health provider reaction to the removal of homosexuality from the DSM in 1973. They, there are many who think, there's no smoking gun here, um, but there are many who, who believe that it was an alternate way, particularly to pathologize and classify gender diversity, particularly in children and youth, um, as a form of mental illness. To use that as a foothold to continue to say that this isn't the right way to be, something is wrong with these people. 40 years later, we're going to jump ahead, um, but we're going to step back for a minute or two, but I just want to show a connection here. 40 years later, as you can see from that picture, the melding of politics and religion is now firmly embedded in the fabric of all American life. We're all impacted by it, but it's, it cannot be separated from conservative American life. If you are a conservative, you are, if you are an evangelical, you are most likely a political conservative. It's, it's just an expectation. There isn't a lot of variation there. Yes, there are exceptions. I always wanna say there are exceptions, but this sense of voting blocks is firmly established in our culture to the point at which we would elect that person. And again, we've leaped forward here a little bit from 1980. The traditional conservative alliance of evangelicals opposed to gay rights, opposed to LGBTQ or LGB issues for sure, um, is joined by a certain faction on the far left that are known as trans exclusionary radical feminists or TERFs. And these are people like JK Rowling who believe that and you're gonna hear a little bit more from one of them um, shortly, who believe that the existence of trans women in particular, although they're not particularly fond of trans men either, that the existence of trans women is diminishing or devaluing actual womanhood. Um, and they're also very much opposed to early intervention or affirmation of gender diversity in children and youth. Uh, any questions on that slide or comments? Scientists at the National Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta today released the results of a study which shows that the lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. Bobby Campbell of San Francisco and Billy Walker of New York both suffer from a mysterious newly discovered disease which affects mostly homosexual men but has also been found in heterosexual men and women. Researchers know of 413 people who have contracted the condition in the past year. One third have died and none have been cured. While Reverend Falwell prepared to release his guidelines for curbing AIDS, homosexuals protested outside. Falwell claims too much emphasis has been put on finding a cure and not enough on preventing the spread of the disease from the gay community to heterosexuals. Why haven't federal health authorities moved against AIDS with the same 
uh, swiftness and dispatch with which they moved against toxic shock syndrome, extra strength Tylenol, and Legionnaire's disease. Homosexuality is a sin. It was California Republican William Dannemeyer who recently declared on the House floor God's plan for man was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Dannemeyer leads a group of conservative Republicans who hope to make AIDS a political issue. They meet to plan strategy for bringing controversial AIDS-related legislation to the House floor. At some point, the public is going to demand action, frankly, to get on with protecting the public health. We want to identify every person who's a carrier. We want to identify every possible way to stop them from, from spreading the disease. And we want to be open and honest about this disease before it becomes a really serious national health threat. Until the Reagan administration realizes that the government's responsibility is saving lives and not saving souls, we will continue to see the virus spread through our society. White House officials confirm that the president has never talked with his Surgeon General about AIDS or read the report Dr. Koop sent him last October. Meanwhile, there's another controversy over the president's plan to appoint a commission on AIDS. Advisors say Mr. Reagan does not intend to appoint any gays. Top researchers say that's an outrage and that they will boycott the commission. To exclude the gay community from a presidential commission on AIDS is the moral equivalent of excluding the Jewish community from a commission on the Holocaust. There was another rally Tuesday outside Dallas City Hall to protest the actions of District Judge Jack Hampton. Hampton admitted sentencing a killer to a shorter prison term because his two victims were homosexuals. Of the 3,200 volunteers in the San Francisco-based test, those so mildly affected they had no symptoms of AIDS and given AZT, showed resilience fighting the disease. We know from this study quite clearly that there will be a delay in progression significantly greater than for individuals who do not take the drug. The gay community, the most affected by AIDS, has been slow to embrace testing for the virus, fearing a witch hunt. For the first time, the number of AIDS cases passed the 100,000 mark. And there are estimates by the end of 1992, 263,000 Americans will be killed by this disease. So y'all may have recognized a couple people in that video, one being Dr. Anthony Fauci, um, who was coming up on 40 years ago, um, advising us on how best to respond to and minimize the impacts of growing pandemics and diseases. Um, but you also see how the language began to demonize gay folks in the news um gay disease right now um this in the newscast uh, tom brokaw referring to well the lifestyle of the gays um leads to disease right now i think there are many ways to have that conversation and yeah i'm not a big fan of criticizing people with the benefit of history to look back at what they said in the moment at the time and saying, oh, you should have done this so much better because we're so much smarter now. Um, I'm not a big fan of doing that, but all those, um, all that terminology, gay disease, homosexual lifestyle, um, these began to be the building blocks of the talking points that those opposed to LGBTQ um, rights and inclusion and equality and access um these were the building blocks of the language that would be used against this population from that point on forward and so in 1980 you had gender diversity pathologized as a mental illness and then you had um aids which was positioned as a disease because of people's moral failings um, not by the scientific community, not by the medical community, but by this growing coalition of political think and conservative, very conservative religious think, these two groups together. And this became a productive mechanism for them to turn people against LGBTQ folks and also increase their political power. Confronting the foundations for 
<clears throat> our cultural societal intolerance is never an easy conversation to have. And there are, there are breadcrumbs along the way that show us how we got here from there. And those breadcrumbs have turned bitter. Right? Those breadcrumbs are rancid. But we need to examine them to understand where we are and where we're going. I think that, um, Jen, just as I reflect back to, you know, I was like a teenager during um, the 80s and thinking about my friends and um, not even really knowing um, anybody who was homosexual in my group, like, because they would never, ever even say something like that and how ignorant I was during that time. Um, and it makes me reflect now, one, on just how sorry I am for not being a supportive person um, to, to friends that I, that I had that needed support and wondering if I'm as supportive as I can be now. Um, and then also wondering who I'm ignorant about now because history has shown us that we're always ignorant about somebody that needs support and help. And as you mentioned, the looking back, we're, we're, we're always much smarter and can think about the words we used and the actions that we took. Um, I don't want to wait 20 years to look back and um, reflect on, on somebody that I'm not serving now. And so I think that's why this kind of training is so important that, um, that we open our eyes because I know we're all here to, because we support our kids and, so, and their families. And so how do we make ourselves more um, awake to what's happening now <laughs> uh, as a result of looking back. So I really appreciate the perspective that you're giving. It's challenging me to really think about um, our actions that we're taking now and every day and, and who we're supporting and who we aren't supporting. Thank you, Jeff. A lot of people died because of inaction in responding to this by thinking that it was, let's just be blunt. You heard Newt Gingrich, you heard uh, William Dannemeyer, right? As long as it was just gay people that were dying, they were okay with that, right? The focus was let's prevent it from getting to the straight people. Um, and that delayed the reaction and response to this disease by years and tens of thousands of people died. So let's talk about what the key, some of the key talking points that people want to use um, against um, affirming gender diverse identity in kids. And I actually left one of them out of here, I just realized, so I will verbally add it in a minute. Um, so there's only gonna be four here, but I'm gonna add a fifth one. Um, so the first one was they don't exist, not until they're adults. This is something that only adults do. Adults at some point decide they'd rather be a woman or they'd rather be a man, and that's a thing. And one of the things that contributed to that was the conflation of gender identity and gender expression with sexual orientation, with homosexuality, right? People didn't become being aware or didn't become expressing the fact that they were same-sex attracted until teens or adult years or so people thought exclusively. Therefore, this whole gender diverse thing must not be real in people until those same ages. So let's not even think about addressing it before that. And also because the only people that had the autonomy to actually speak out and say, hey, this is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm feeling. I'm looking to get some help some guidance on this. The only people that could do that were adults, right? Kids couldn't self-actualize. Kids couldn't go to a doctor or a clinic or anything and say, hey, so I've been feeling like a boy or I've been feeling like a girl for a long time. Mom and dad don't understand. Maybe you could help me. Certainly that wasn't an option in the 1950s or 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s or even early 2000s. Interestingly enough, and this is a good thing, more youth are able to access that now, at least have conversations with people. Second talking point, over-attached mothers make boys transgender uh, or gay. Tony, at the break, you said, this is so ridiculous that you just feel like walking out of here. This isn't what I wanted to do. I have no patience for this. 
You My, think they're just dead, I, right? I think they're absolutely ridiculous. I think that it's none of their business. What do you care? If you're helping families, K Sarah, wonderful for you. Are you you could have never. Our outcome? Are you I interested about send, our successes? I, no, I'm you're not, not interested in, in you successes. at all. No, because I think that it's, you're if, if you're helping in, families, you're not that's in children wonderful. Who have changed. You don't care about no, that? No, I'm not, because I don't believe that. I believe you could browbeat a child into anything. I'm not talking I about browbeating. That. And it's interesting Isn't that, that what you you're saying so to horribly do? demonized us without even knowing really anything about I, what I we do. I saw you on the last show. Do you want to listen to what we have to you say? less than 20 minutes of... I'm living what you're trying to tell me. You're, but the you're, point you're is to so listen and learn rather than just demonize right off the bat. I don't want to learn anything you from learn you. Something? For the sake of your child? Dr. Singh, here's, you? here's yeah. a big concern I have. I mean, I'm a parenting no, no, no. expert. I'm a parenting expert. And one thing that I'm so really concerned that people listening to this show might come away with is that if a mother is close to her, her son, child. that she's going to make him yeah. into a, a, think he's a girl. I there is not one piece of evidence. There's said. not one piece of evidence that a mother being attuned to her son and close to her son is going to make that boy think he's a girl. Not one well, piece of evidence. Zero. Let's not and here, no, let's no, not that, no. This it. is what you're saying. So what we need to do is promote parents loving their children. Just because you're a psychologist does not make you smarter about this than me. Because when you live something, you learn, you know more. I know a lot more than you do. I don't even want to talk anymore. Thank God. Now we can go proceed with you what we do. Go ahead. Go ahead. We don't force. We don't force the child to do anything. If the boy is playing with Barbie dolls, let the father get on the ground and play with the Barbie dolls, but let the father bond with the boy. The boy will eventually surrender the Barbie dolls and make that identification oh, with the father. Oh, really? Look, I don't want sarcasm. Are we going to talk? I mean, <laughs> we, we talk about our position. I, I mean, I'm trying to present. Wait a minute. You can't edit her response. Okay, but I, mean, I want to be able to present my... You, know, our you, you, you can do why? it, but you can't, you, you can't the dictate the response from your yeah. audience. Yeah, but to, to say that we are unloving, we are loving. It's about an emotional connection. It's not about forcing children to do certain behaviors. It's not the behaviors. It's the bonding attachment with the father. But I've already made it clear that he had a very strong bond with his father. His well, father threw the Barbie in the garbage and then had to jump in the dumpster and go get it. It's not about loving the child. Okay, it's so about, what do I do, though? If it's I, not about an emotion. It's I not about you, love. If it's I come about to an you and I wasn't an over-involved mom and I wasn't attached to my son. As a matter of fact, I wasn't attached to him at all. Um, what do I do then? I wasn't over-involved with him. You seem over-involved now. <laughs> now I have no choice. You're, you're highly emotional. I mean... We're talking about... Oh my God. Why, of is it, why is it we always get these mothers? Where are the fathers? You, get you feel that this is a therapy, not for you. That's fine. But we're trying to present a treatment that works for other mothers who bring in their children who are concerned. The therapy works this. for them. They desire it. Why can't we present that's that viewpoint? I So we can have a whole different conversation about Dr. Phil <laughs> at some point in time. But um, this, this, this episode of this, um, of this show was seen by so many families of gender diverse and trans kids. Um, and it is often touted um, as an example of how folks that are um, supportive of or believe that conversion therapy um, or um, reparative therapy is another term that's often referred to as, um, are simply dismissed because they claim to have so many success stories. At the end, you'll notice he says, this therapy works for other mothers. Well, you're not doing the therapy on the mother, you're doing the therapy on the child. And what that reveals is that a lot of kids are brought to these conversion therapists or reparative therapists by parents or caregivers that are uncomfortable with the thought that their child is going to grow up to either be gay or transgender. And so the therapy is really designed to reflect the parent's disapproval or lack of acceptance. He never talks about, does it work for the kids? Are the kids better off? Are the kids happier? Um, how do they do long term as a result of this? 75 to 95 percent of kids become gay or gender normative in their teens rather than transgender. 
So kids that present as gender nonconforming, gender diverse, trans, and early childhood or early adolescence. Um, the claim is that between 75 and 95 percent of them later become quote unquote just gay, um, or it was a phase and they pass out of it. And this comes out of um, th this quote unquote statistic, which was massively debunked later because um, of sample bias that was done in the study and really poor study uh, methodology. Um, and yet it's just remains one of the strong talking points for folks that are opposed to affirming gender diversity in children and youth. Once it came out, the biggest proponent of it, the one who really popularized this, was uh, Kenneth Zucker, who is a, a, a psychiatrist who worked at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, Canada. So how was it debunked and what was the problem with their methodology? The reason it was debunked is that the pool of youth that Steensmo was working with included the entire range of sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression kids. So there were gay kids in that group. There were, there were gender nonconforming, feminine or masculine straight kids in that group. There were trans kids in that group. There were all kinds of kids in this group, right? They didn't isolate them from each other. The group was studied as a whole. And at the end of the study, because there was a large percentage of gay youth that were simply non-conforming, so gay boys that were feminine or lesbian or gay girls that were masculine, or straight cis-normative youth that were gender non-conforming in some way, all stopped being gender non-conforming or identified as gay. And so then they reported out of the group, the study, and, and but, they said that it applied only to trans youth. It wasn't just about trans kids. And so it's junk science. And yet it continues to be a major talking point to get people to not affirm, to get educators, parents, healthcare providers, society in general, to not affirm gender diversity in childhood because, hey, just don't do anything, and 75 to 95% of these kids are going to turn out just the way you want them to. Talking point four, quote, I'm going to use the pejorative words here. Sex changes make transgender people suicidal. They are also more likely to be rapists. That's an actual quote that again gets repeated a lot, primarily in anti-trans generated literature. And this comes from a, a longitudinal study that was done at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and that was released in 2011. And this has been in the zeitgeist since 2011, certainly in the anti-trans talking points zeitgeist. But it's an intentional misrepresentation of what the study concluded. But it was picked up on almost immediately, the misinterpretation of it was picked up on almost immediately by conservative and religious media. Again, this political marriage, one pushes the messaging of the other and vice versa, right? Um, and so these are just some of the of the publication. I mean, you can put Breitbart in there, you can put the Daily Caller, um, and it continues to be regurgitated now. It's probably the most regurgitated, um, intentionally misinforming statement that, well, you know, most trans people are suicidal even after they have a gender affirmation surgery. It's just pushed out there to say, and the goal is to say, medical treatment for trans people from adolescence, teens, on up through adulthood isn't effective because they still want to kill themselves. Oh, and they're more likely to be rapists because they tried to make a correlation that showed people that had criminal behavior before they had gender reassignment surgery still exhibited criminal behavior after gender reassignment surgery, um, including sex crimes. So, I guess they thought gender reassignment surgery was supposed to eliminate criminal tendencies too. 
This is the actual person, one of the actual people that did this research, uh, Cecilia Dane. She's a, uh, a Swedish researcher. And in an interview, and there's the link at the bottom, you can go and read the whole interview with her. Um, and this is her quote, people who misuse the study always omit the fact that the study itself clearly states that it is not an evaluation of gender dysphoria treatment. If we look at the literature, we find that several recent studies conclude that World Professional Association for Transgender Health, or WPATH, the standards of care for compliant treatment decrease gender dysphoria and improves mental health. So a short summary, all the study said was that for people that have experienced lifelong or long-term trauma related to rejection um, um, by family and by culture because they were gender diverse, for people that carry that trauma into having medical treatment up to and including gender affirmation or gender reassignment surgery, um, um, or gender confirmation surgery is a better term for it, actually, um, that that medical treatment doesn't in and of itself resolve all the trauma. Um, and that's what the study concluded, that ongoing care and concern for people to help resolve existing trauma should be offered and, and facilitated for folks because surgery doesn't solve all issues, it just solves some of the issues. And yet the people that are intent on um, demonizing, affirming education, affirming treatment, um, affirming cultural attitudes, societal attitudes for trans people, crunch that all down to say, oh, well, no, surgery doesn't work because afterwards trans, trans people are still suicidal. And that's a complete misrepresentation of the study. So most of the 2000s, starting with um, then Mayor Gavin Newsom, he's now the governor of California, but then Mayor Gavin Newsom in San Francisco, who said, in San Francisco, we're going to legalize, we're going to issue marriage certificates for gay people. And that was the first uh, municipality in the US to do that, which opened a floodgate. Um, Portland followed very shortly thereafter. And within about a week, my partner and I went down to the Multnomah County Courthouse and got ourselves gay married, right? It didn't last long because it was later rescinded by the, by the state. But um, this really launched into high gear, the conversation and legal cases about legalizing same-sex marriage. And with that, the, both the political right most often represented by the Republican Party at the times, uh, of these times, and the evangelical um, far right, um, extreme, extremist Christian conservatives. This became their thing. This was the hill that they were gonna die on. And so for the next uh, 12 years, um, maybe, maybe 11 years, 10 years, um, after the first legal gay marriages were performed in San Francisco, um, the focus was we, we've got to not let this happen. Oh my God, this is our issue. This is how we're going to get George Bush reelected in 2004. This is how we're going to get um, John McCain elected in 2008. Um, this is how we're going to get Mitt Romney elected in 2012. This is how we're going to get judges put on federal benches and courts. This is how we're going to get local people elected. We got to get, we're going to use this issue to terrify this political base that we've created now so that we can't let this happen because this will be the ultimate downfall of the morals of America. If you are now or have ever been a parent to a 15-year-old, you know just how impressionable and fickle they can be. This story broke in 2015. Keep that in mind as we tell you about a shocking new policy in one western state that would allow 15-year-olds to have sex change procedures done without parents even knowing about it. Here's correspondent Dan Springer in Oregon. 
15-year-olds in Oregon can't smoke, give blood, or get a tattoo, but now they can get drugs to suppress puberty and even a sex change operation without their parents' consent, and the government will pay for it. It is trespassing on the hearts, the minds, and the bodies of our children. They're our children. And for a decision, a life-altering decision like that to be done uh, unbeknownst to a parent or a guardian is it's mind-boggling. The decision was made by Oregon's Health Evidence Review Commission, or HERC. With no public debate, it began covering cross-sex hormones, puberty-suppressing drugs, and sex reassignment surgeries for Medicaid enrollees in January. A transgender activist says not requiring parental permission will save lives through suicide prevention. Parents may not be supportive. Um, they, they may not be in an environment where they feel uh, the parent will um, affirm their identity. The American Psychiatric Association classifies gender dysphoria as a mental disorder. A 2008 study concluded most children with gender dysphoria grow out of it after puberty. The Oregon Health Authority can't say how many children have been treated by the state for gender dysphoria since January. Herc estimates it will lead to one less suicide attempt a year and cost about $150,000. In Salem, Dan Springer, Fox News. We had been working on providing testimony and crafting testimony to the Health Evidence Review Committee. Uh, commission in Oregon. Uh, and we've been working back and forth with them on this for two years prior to them authorizing coverage of gender affirming health care under the Oregon Health Plan. Um, and it finally went into effect in, um, in early in January of 2015. This ginning up of unreasonable hate based on disinformation, and there was a lot of disinformation in that story, by the way. Um, leads some people to do extremely violent um, and transgressive things, like send people death threats and worse. So with that, any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so um, hopefully I can phrase this right. But I've just like reflected on um, just like the fact of like the human brain fully developing at the age of 25. And so I just kind of want to hear you talk about that in light of like this. So when we talk about cognitive development, we talk about brain development. You're absolutely right. I mean, in many ways, the developmental changes that are somewhat related to puberty, the uh, maturation changes, actually don't really begin to fully resolve until about our mid-20s. Um, so that's true. That's the science. There's, there's no argument about that. But that doesn't mean that across every spectrum of our own self-knowledge and capacity to dis make decisions, it doesn't apply equally universally across all of those different areas, right? I don't think you're supporting this, but I know you're alluding to this argument that, well, kids, kids don't really know because their brains aren't fully formed till age 25. So how could they really know this about themselves? We should wait. My counter argument to that is then, then why are you working so hard to reinforce the gender identities of kids who aren't transgender? I mean, what if they change their mind, right? Why, oh, I know, it's because where they're currently at agrees with where you think they should currently be at. And so in those cases, those kids' cognitive capacity to know themselves is spot on. But in the case of kids who, whose identities don't correspond with what you think they should be, we should wait till they're 25 before we provide them any support for that. People know who they are, right? Cisgender boys that identify as boys know they're boys. Transgender girls who know they're girls are girls. I hope that answered your question or responded to it in some way, Olivia. Yeah, yeah that was good. And yeah, I'm definitely not implying we don't support no. um, students, um, but just kind of the irreversible um, decision of like, you know, impacting their whole life for that like surgery, surgery or whatever. And so just to be clear, pubertal suppression is not irreversible. Pubertal right. suppression is a pause button. Mm -hmm. If they, if they do change their minds and stop taking the pubertal suppression treatment, puberty will pick right back up 
where it left off right. and they'll and they'll go through puberty. On August 16th, 2018, an article by Lisa Littman of Brown University was published in the journal PLOS One, titled Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria in Adolescents and Young Adults, a Study of Parental Reports. It looked at data taken from 256 surveys completed by parents recruited from three websites. We'll come back to those, where parents had reported rapid onsets of gender dysphoria. Littman's stated purpose for these surveys was to document and explore observations to describe this presentation of gender dysphoria that is supposedly inconsistent with existing research literature. In the background section of the article, Littman expresses concern that current literature on youth gender dysphoria, especially regarding persistence and desistance rates, only included subjects whose gender dysphoria began in childhood, rather than including kids who developed dysphoria in adolescence. She also describes a social and peer contagion that may influence behaviors in adolescence. And although she can't cite studies that link social or peer contagions to transgender identity directly, she cites their role in eating disorders as a mechanism that could influence trans identification, especially thanks to the increase in visibility, social media, and user-generated online content about transgender issues and transition. From all of this, she has two emerging hypotheses. One, that social contagion is a key determinant of rapid onset gender dysphoria, and two, that rapid onset gender dysphoria is a maladaptive coping mechanism for adolescents and young adults. The study was lauded by conservatives and anti-trans activists alike as proof of trans identification spreading like a virus among our children. Breitbart described it as, study draws transgender ire, peer pressure and prior psychiatric illness linked to gender issues in teens. LifeSite News, a conservative Christian website, published an article titled, Parents Beware, Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria, a Social Contagion Among Girls. Parents from Mumset, which calls itself the UK's most popular website for parents, saw the study as validation of all their fears of trans rights advocates targeting their children. The American College of Pediatricians, a conservative advocacy group rather than a medical organization who believe transgender people have a mental illness and believe that it is self-evident that there is a purposeful design to human nature, cited the study when advocating against trans-affirming health care. A letter to the actual medical organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, from an online group of parents of trans kids, supposedly with over a thousand members, begged them to reconsider their affirmation-oriented approach and cited Littman's study as proof of their kids being victims of a social contagion. This letter really got my attention. Here's how Littman's article was presented. A recent groundbreaking study of an emergent late-onset predominantly female trans-identifying patient population finds significant parallels with the phenomenon of eating disorders and includes social contagion as a key factor. And it doesn't. This study doesn't find proof of anything. It was, from the beginning, an attempt to mine for data to get a specific outcome. And so this Transgender study Trend is, shockingly, a website for parents questioning the trans narrative. They're probably most infamous for their resource pack for schools, which objects to the use of inaccurate labels such as cis, discourages publicly celebrating a transgender child, and describes trans kids as a biologically impossible situation. We'll dive into that guide a little bit more later, but because of this guide and, well, everything else about their site, they were uninvited from the Stonewall Children and Young People Conference for holding well-publicized anti-trans views. They are explicitly anti-affirmational in their approach to trans kids, and, like Fourth Wave Now, any subject recruited through this website has been conditioned by its content to reject their child's trans identity. And so Transgender Trend is, a, is predominantly a website. They have published um, that booklet you saw there that was really pushed to school districts as um, a subjective, I'm sorry, as an objective um, approach to how the school districts and schools should respond to gender diversity in their students and in their districts. Um, and it was anything but objective. Right. Transgender Trend, along with another website that they that he mentioned, uh, Fourth Wave Now, fourthwavenow.com, are both primarily anti-trans, um, trans exclusionary radical feminists. Remember that slide from earlier, TERF, run um, entities whose sole purpose is to demonize and disinform people about gender diversity 
and increasingly specifically about gender diversity in children and youth. So referring to this study from Lisa Lippman, which um, was actually published and there was an article about it in The Atlantic uh, in 2018. Um, she called it a conclusion, right? That what she found in this study. And, but the conclusion was just a series of hypotheses, possibilities, potentialities. Um, none of these conclusions were clinically validated in any way, either statistically or even observationally. Um, and one of her main conclusions was, we should look into this more, right? So Lisa Lippman, look, I, I've got no, no ax to grind against, yeah, should we look into this more? Sure we should. Why do I think that? It's because it's my job and it's what I do every day. Every day I'm looking into this more. Every day I'm trying to better understand not only what my experience as a trans person was and currently is, yeah. Let's keep looking into why are kids who they are? Sure, nothing wrong with that. But again, the political right, the religious right, this coalition of these two groups took these questions that Lisa Lippman asked and turned them into, these are facts. They made up a diagnosis called rapid onset gender dysphoria. But there is an alternative. And this one is based on evidence. There is an evidence-based explanation for why assigned female at birth youth come out or present more as transgender in adolescence. There's some assigned female at birth youth. They all kind of have a certain look to them. They kind of have a certain style about them. Hmm. What might that be a reflection of? Girls, for the most part, in most families, safely get to be tomboys without a lot of cultural pushback, without a lot of shaming, all of which happens to boys who express themselves in ways that culture perceives as feminine. That forces boys to either conform and hide their true selves, or it forces them to come out and be visible about their feelings younger and hope that they're in a family or in a community that will embrace and affirm that. But girls have this additional grace period. In most places, again, it's not universal and it's not universal in all families. People assigned female at birth have this great grace period of being a tomboy, which means until puberty, until menstruation starts, until bodily changes start happening, until sexuality arises, until all those pieces start being able to be put together and the, and the young assigned female at birth person begins to process those feelings, they may not know until they're into their teens that it's not just that they like to dress like a boy, it's that, wait a minute, I am a boy. So let's look at two different realities, if you're cisgender or if you're transgender. So the one on the left applies to most of the people on the planet, applies to most of the people on this call. There's nothing wrong with what you're gonna see on the left side of the screen. But I just wanna show you the difference. If you're cisgender, you're seen by society as having a superior gender experience. If you're trans, you're seen as having an inferior gender experience. If you're cis, if you are, of a religious faith, um, um, then it's quite possible that your supreme being approves of your gender identity. If you're transgender, it's quite possible that your religious faith's supreme being does not approve of it, or you're certainly aware that other people's religious faiths don't approve of it. You're, if you're cis, your Gender identity is coordinated with your reproductive biology. If you're trans, it's independent of your reproductive biology. If you're cis, um, your identity serves binary dependent structures, such as misogyny and patriarchy. Yes, you're cis, you're a boy, you're entitled to this. You're cis, you're a girl, you're entitled to this, which is a little bit smaller of a list than what the boys get, but it all lines up with misogyny and patriarchy, and that works for us. That works for, for us 
the misogyny and patriarchal society, right? If you're trans, your mere existence com contradicts or complicates those things. If you're cis, likelihood is that your documentation and your self-identity match, have matched from the time that you were born. If you're trans, that's not true. If you're cis, the validity of your gender identity is based on the right evidence, i.e. your genitals. But if you're trans, the validity of your gender identity is based on the wrong thing, your brain. And finally, your personal appearance conforms to other people's perception of what it should be. Hey, you look to me like you're this, and oh, and you think you're that too? Well, that's a good thing. We both agree. But if you're trans, your personal appearance may not conform to what other people's perception of what you should be is. So there's a lot of information on this slide. So let's just talk about one of the ways. There are many ways, but we don't have time to go into all of them. So one of the ways that um, our support for, and again, this is about ways in which language and disinformation um, and, actual, and actions such as sabotage are all geared towards trying to make the general public not entertain the idea that gender is a diverse experience, that it's naturally more diverse than we've been told it is, and that we should be inclusive and supportive of people that are expressing and experiencing it in that natural diversity, right? So the, the current big push is that Title IX, current interpretations of Title IX, means that trans women are excluding trans girls, uh, I'm sorry, are excluding cisgender girls from schools, athletic scholarships, from victories or being successful in their individual sports. And you can see the messaging there on the top. Um, I think I left out a quote. Oh, no, it's two, two paragraphs. Leftist Democrats led by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are pushing for policy changes which would allow biological male athletes who say they identify as transgender to compete against women. This is an affront to fairness and common sense. That was a huge campaign ad that ran um, in several states, but the one that I'm thinking of right now is the state of Michigan. And so this is the current conversation. There's a pledge there that people are asked to sign. And partially it says, I support the rights of women student athletes to be to a fair playing field and equal opportunity, blah, 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 and to oppose any candidate platform or policy which would allow biological males to compete. So according to a recent Pew poll, 90% of Americans say they know someone who's lesbian, gay, or bisexual. But only 16% of Americans say they personally know someone who is transgender. However, the same poll showed that 27% of millennials know someone who's transgender, but only 9% of Americans over age 45 say the same thing. So given this reality, since most Americans learn about trans people through the media, and that's both online media and broadcast media, as well as print media, um, it's pretty important that when the media talks about trans people that they get the information right. Um, we've covered 60 years here of how there's been a concerted effort to coalesce people around believing the disinformation that is distributed by certain power factions, right? But there is a specific language that they use, this specific language, and you can recognize it and identify it and know it when you see it. So this list on the left are the organizations, entities, sometimes websites, that are the most common and prolific distributors of intentional disinformation designed to prejudice people against trans folks in general, trans youth in particular. Um, and you'll see the asterisk there. Um, there's an organization called the American College of Pediatricians, which sounds very official and very authoritative, and they've got a cool letterhead. Um, and they've even got PhDs and MDs on there that are members of that organization. And they want you to believe or confuse them with the American Academy of Pediatrics. The American College of Pediatricians is a ultra conservative, religious organization that primarily takes 
anti-LGBTQ positions on everything. The American Academy of Pediatrics has been around for 70 years, has over 70,000 members, and has done extensive research and has issued position papers supporting affirmation for gender diverse, trans, non-conforming, non-binary uh, children and youth because the evidence shows that it leads to healthier outcomes. So what are the, what's the code language? How do we know, how do we discern fact from fiction? Is what we're hearing or reading based on fact or is it based on fiction? Here's your secret decoder ring. If they refer to gender diverse children or youth or people in general as experiencing gender confusion, they like to do that. They like to say, kids that don't conform to the way you think they should be are confused, which is a flip, right? You may be confused about the fact that you don't know why they feel the way they do, but that doesn't make them confused, but they want to sow seeds of doubt. The kid is just confused. We can ignore this. Um, to frame um, advocacy, activism, um, human rights work as pushing a gender ideology. Um, using the word transgender um, in, in print, always in quotes, or if someone's talking about it saying, well, this Jen Burlton does training and education and she identifies as transgender, um, which is of course meant to imply it's not a real thing. You know, it's silly, it's not a real thing. Um, same, same point there. I think I just made both multiple points at the same time. Um, referring to it as, as, as if being gender diverse was a belief system. So isms most commonly tend to be belief systems. Um, and so there is no such word as transgenderism. Um, being gender diverse is not a belief system. It's a state of being and it's a naturally occurring state of being. Referring to kids that identify as a boy, although they were assigned female at birth or identify as a girl, although they were assigned male at birth or identify as non-binary, um, referring to their identity as they have a fictitious identity. It's a value judgment, right? I've decided that the, how you identify is not real, and therefore I'm gonna tell other people that you are indulging in an identity fiction. These are all things that you will see repeatedly in publications, in literature that is pushed to you as educators. That being gender diverse is against biological science. That's under the assumption that there's only two types of people, XX chromosome people and XY chromosome people. And the fact of the matter is that scientifically that is absolutely not true. Not everybody is one or the other. There are triple X people. There are, there are XXY people. There are XYY people. There are almost 46 different genetic variations on chromosomal makeup and in the even more variations related to how hormones are produced and absorbed within human bodies. The biological science of this is that gender is far more flexible, I'm sorry, that sexual biology is far more flexible and diverse than some people want you to believe. Um, you have officially attended part two of your gender indoctrination today. So um, y'all can check that off your, your bucket list. Um, part three is still to come. They continually, so remember what I said in, in 1980 in the DSM-3, they, they pathologized it with a diagnosis of gender identity disorder. Well, that stayed in the DSM until 2012, maybe 2013. Um, at, which, at which point the DSM-5 came out. And gender identity disorder, much like the earlier classification of being homosexual as a disorder, gender identity disorder was, that phrase and term was eliminated from the DSM-5. And it is now referred to as someone experiencing gender dysphoria. In other words, discomfort with the gender role they were assigned at birth and or perhaps the, their body parts, their physiology related to that. And it's different in this way. They recognize that the discomfort not comes from the internal uh, variance itself. It comes from depression, trauma, anxiety, isolation that, of being a person that is like that and what they're experiencing within their culture. 
right? So gender dysphoria is partially an internal discomfort with biological physiology, but the, heart, the largest component of that is trauma and depression related to living in an unaccepting society. And of course, an oldie but a goodie, that people that are trans, particularly trans women, are bathroom predators. It's nonsense. There's no evidence to support this whatsoever. Right? So again, all these things are words, word combinations, framing of conversations that you will see repeatedly on places like Transgender Trend or Fourth Wave Now, or in publications that are intended for school, um, for educators to use as guidelines for creating policies that are, yes, we love gender diverse kids, but we don't wanna encourage this stuff. When you see these words, you are hearing the language of oppression, um, in some cases, hate and um, exclusion. Hi, Jen, I have a question for you. Yeah. So when you're referring to transgender, is that also, and like the, some of the research, is that also including the um, non binary groups, or do they have a whole different amount of research to, you know, kind of um, yeah. describe what they're going through? Yeah, so it, it absolutely does. The reason non binary um, isn't in there is because like many people, um, even the oppositional forces haven't quite got their head around the concept of non-binary yet. So they don't actually know how to oppose it, right? They, they don't actually know how to create language. So it's still all focused on those people that are going from one team to the other. Um, non-binary is still too much of a mystery for them. And, and they figure that if they can kind of bias people against trans people, that they're gonna sort of catch those non-binaries in there at the same time. Great question. Never been asked that question. Great question. So this is the intersection of the far right, represented by Kaylee triller Hare, and the far left, represented by Miriam Ben Shalom. interject there too and I think uh, sometimes kind of clarifying the language is important because I didn't know any of this stuff before this battle found me but I think a lot of us when we use the word gender a lot of us have used it as a synonym for biological sex we would use them like the gender reveal for for babies right um, but like was already described there's a separation now and what the movement is trying to do is to say that biological sex doesn't matter in a legal sense and that gender does that's what's important, gender expression, gender identity. And what that looks like for women, uh, the way this is playing out, like let's, let's take Title IX for instance. Okay, so I paid for my college education with a basketball scholarship. There was recently a six foot seven male who identifies as a woman um, who took a woman's basketball spot on a women's basketball team. It's happening in weightlifting. There is currently a volleyball player who's trying to get on the women's Olympic team. This, um, and so when gender identity wins, I believe that women always lose. And just to make sure we're not confusing this topic, sure. I know that, Miriam, what you're saying is you're not against people being trans. This is not a battle against a trans identity if people want to adopt that. That's this correct. is very specific about saying because of that trans identity, our government, the laws, the social conscience right now seems to be shifting to say the one last place where women have felt that they have privacy, that they have some space to be a woman is now in question of being violated. And that's why you've really risen up and said, I've got to talk about it. Yeah, I, I don't hate transgendered people, okay? I don't think they should be discriminated against. I think they should have the very same human rights that any one of you or any one of us here has. Okay, what I don't like is that they're co-opting my humanity and denying me the vocabulary that I use to describe myself. They are denying me the basic human right of privacy. Further, I'm disturbed by what I see as the transgender communities what's the word, it, it is an outreach, but reaching out to children. 
Um, if you go online, you will find that there are a number of parents, organizations, whatever, who say that their, their kids, their, their little kids, are transgender. Um, I don't she think just said so. it. I don't think children really know about stuff like that, and I think it's Munchausen by proxy or vile perniciousness. Um, even I might use the word pedophilia, and I, I know this may be hard for some of you out there, because this is dicey stuff, okay? It's touchy stuff, I know. But it bothers me that they reach out to children. So Miriam Ben Shalom um, is a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. And she and Kaylee Triller Haver, from the left and from the right, formed an organization called Hands Across the Aisle, which is anti-lesbian, gay, bisexual people, primarily coming from a religious perspective, creating a partnership with lesbian, gay, bisexual, radical feminists, not all radical feminists, just trans exclusionary ones, to find agreement on the fact that trans people are um, <laughs> are messing everything up for everybody else and they're going after our children. This is most publicly visible now to people because of J.K. Rowling um, sort of going public as someone who supports that ideology. That is our training. I know we're right at quitting time. Um, I, again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate um, your engagement um, and your commitment to this work. And I'm happy to stay and answer any questions that anybody has if you have the flexibility to stay a couple extra minutes. But of course, you can always send me your questions directly in email. You will all be getting access to this video probably in about a week um, online, just as part one of this training was offered. And with that, I just really, again, thank you all. And if you have any questions, please begin. Otherwise, when Dr. Williams gives me the sign, we can shut this puppy down. Jen, thank you for just another um, powerful, powerful session. This was just super informative. Jen, what about, you know, so we live in a super, um, and, and I come from and, and participate in, you know, a strong Christian community. And so much of this really felt like the, you know, the church is the devil. So um, in, in some ways, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we know better, right? We know that that's not the entire story. That Absolutely. Kind of thing. Um, you know, what would you say if, if it's possible someone's leaving kind of, um, you know, just concerned about views of religion or Christianity as a result of today's training? Um, thank you, Dr. Williams, for asking that question. Um, absolutely, to everything you said, um, I adore Christians. Um, I am not a Christian myself, but I adore Christians. I, I think the, the amount of good work that people of the Christian faith, um, as well as other faiths, have done around the world is astounding. Um, but I think one of the challenges that we have is that most of the people that are, and I'm not going to get into the whole, well, I think they're doing Christianity right. I, I'm not a Christian. And, and first of all, I think one of the tenets of Christianity is not to judge another person's faith. So I'm not going to do that as an atheist, and I would encourage Christians not to do that. But judge people by their works, right? And I think one of the challenges is that most traditional Christian organizations, most non um, sort of very conservative evangelical organizations still sort of adhere to this concept of, I don't discuss politics and religion together. My, my faith and my religion is independent. It's what it is. And the challenge with that is that now 40 going on 50 years afterwards, the voices of people who are of the Christian faith or other religious faith that believe in inclusion and equity in the same way that they were at the forefront of a civil rights march. Um, one of my heroes in life is, is, is a former Catholic priest named um, James Grappi, um, who was a Catholic priest, who was one of the first people 
marching with Jesse Jackson and other people in my hometown of Milwaukee um, for open housing and against school segregation and things like that. White man, Catholic priest, Jesuit, Catholic Church was right out in front of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, so the history of Christianity being in support of, of social justice and human rights is vast, but they're not as loud as the voice of people that are opposed to that. And so I don't have time to do an apologetic or a sort of a whole session that is sort of like, let me take 15 minutes to talk about how awesome people, right? But know that this is about a small extremist faction of the Christian faith that has taken over a political party. Right? And this isn't even a diatribe against the Republicans, people who are Republicans, right? There are plenty of people who are Republican or conservative political thinkers that don't sign on to this nonsense, but they've been taken over by this as well. So plenty of us are alienated in different ways from sort of the sanctity, if I can use that word, um, and deeply held authenticity of our own experiences that, yeah, I'm a conservative because I believe in, in conservative approach to economics, I believe in all these different things, but I don't, I love that quote from that one person from the 70s that said, uh, he applied it to um, Ronald Reagan, I think, but it could be applied to anybody, is that political parties need to realize, um, and this was in relation to the AIDS epidemic, um, we'll all be better off when they realize they're in the job of saving lives and not saving souls. Wow. Right? That's somebody else's job. That's somebody, if you turn to somebody else to save your soul because that's your religious faith, I'm with you 100%. I will, I will be the first in line to fall under assault to protect your right to do that. But you don't get to use that to oppress me. And what, you, what you're bringing um, to us is just what we've been saying in our... Um, conversations in general you got to talk about stuff we can't just kind of keep religion in the closet over here politics in the closet over there and race over here and then never the the twain like you did earlier so me but we we have to unpack that because it's informing how we interact and, and it informs our decisions and it informs you know who we value and who voices we hear and i mean all of those things and um, I think it's important to bring it to the fore and to, to understand the why behind a lot of where we are.